Good morning, church. Welcome to First Baptist Church. Glad that you are here this morning. Uh, I've got several uh, prayer requests, or not prayer requests, I'm getting ahead of myself. got several announcements before we get started this morning, uh, so the, I want to get through those. Um, the first is, uh, congratulations, graduates. We've got uh, a long list of graduates in our bulletin this morning. Uh, and we want to uh, celebrate them and, and uh, be grateful for them as they're going through graduation. Still have some to come, uh, but uh, very, very happy for them this morning. Uh, also, um, welcome, welcome back this section of our congregation. Hey, good to see you. Uh, yesterday we had a, a good group of people here uh, helping to clean up and to move all the stuff that was blocking this section uh, back into our fellowship hall. Still making some progress, a little bit more of things to do, but we had a good group of people here that were scrubbing chairs with brushes. They, they were scrubbing down tables. Those tables are, probably have never been as clean as they are now. And, uh, and scrubbing down pr practically everything in the kitchen and in the back room area. So thank you to all the, of you who came and worked very hard to... Uh, to help clean up and, and get our fellowship all back in order. And I think in light of that, um, I'm going to bring before the deacons that uh, anyone who spills on tables and chairs in the fellowship hall will be subject to church discipline. <laughs> okay. This is serious business. Uh, no, you know, we, we do all these things because we want our church to be used. Amen? We do all these things because we want to get stuff dirty again. Amen? <laughs> yeah, even if we have to clean it up. But uh, Fellowship Hall is coming along well, and, and that we had a good, good work day yesterday. Uh, a couple other things coming up. We announced this uh, last week, but just another reminder. It's summer, so we have uh, camp and VBS coming up. Uh, Heartland Camp is coming up in July. You can uh, uh, start to register for that. That's for grades 4 through 6. And then VBS is coming up also in July, mid-July. And that's for ages uh, three all the way through entering sixth grade. Uh, you can register for uh, either of these things right now. You can do it uh, online. You can also do it in person. And we're very excited to have uh, these things coming. Uh, also for VBS, if you'd like to volunteer and help out with that, uh, please let us know and uh, let Chris know. Uh, give her a call or uh, just uh, even fill out on a card, throw that in the offering as it comes along. Uh, we're excited to have that. And this year, again, VBS, the uh, theme is going to be on uh, the sanctity of life. So a very uh, uh, special uh, VBS this year, interesting VBS. Uh, also, the women's ministry, uh, they have a, an event coming up in just a few weeks at the, towards the end of June, June 23rd. It's going to be a, car a carnival movie night, uh, and uh, it's, it's free, and it's going to have uh, hot dogs, chips, snow cones, cotton candy, popcorn, and more. Uh, they're also going to be watching um, a movie, a heavily edited movie, I should add, uh, but uh, it's going to be a lot of fun and uh, a, a great way to kick off the summer, and this is open to all our ladies, and please invite others as well, so you can find out more about that in the bulletin. Uh, also in the month of June, uh, Father's Day is coming up, June 19th. Where are my fathers? They're asleep. See? Already. Didn't take long. Uh, Father's Day also means we're having parent-child dedication. That's going to be June 19th. So this is for um, uh, our families, our church families, uh, member families. And if you have a, a child who is uh, three or under, and you know we could stretch that for special consideration for different things, uh, we, we'd love to be a part of, of your dedicating them to the Lord as parents. Uh, so please let me know that you'd like to do that, and uh, let me know as soon as you can so we can prepare for that and get things ready. Uh, but June 19th, we will be having a parent-child dedication. Uh, and then uh, one more announcement, and that is in your uh, bulletin, you got a little bookmark. This is our first stab at making uh, something like this. Uh, it's, called, it's a bookmark for our upcoming series. In the month of June, July, and August through the summer, we're going to be going through a, a series that's taking a little bit of a break from our series in the book of Acts. Today will be 50 weeks in the book of Acts, almost a full year. Yeah? Yeah. So we're going to take a little break, and we're going to look at uh, some of the, the most popular major stories in the Bible 
telling the whole story, the whole story of each one of those stories, stories that are often kind of skimmed over, but we're also connecting those stories to the whole story of the Bible in the salvation of Jesus Christ. So looking forward to that, and uh, you'll find the, um, all of the different messages in there, although I like to change my titles, so that might happen over the course of time, and uh, excited to get that started next Sunday. Uh, now, the, the last thing is not an announcement, but it is Memorial Day weekend, and I think it is, it's only right before we begin worship to take a, mem- a moment to remember those who have given their life in service to our country. So uh, if you would, uh, if you have uh, lost a relative uh, or a spouse, perhaps, in battle, uh, would you stand uh, to honor them this morning? If you've lost a relative in service to our country, would you stand to honor them this morning? Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, to begin our our worship this morning, we'd like to start with a call to worship and do that from the Psalms. Psalm chapter 7, verse 17 says this. I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness, and I will sing praise to the name of the Lord the Most High. Would you pray with me as we begin our worship service this morning? Lord God, this Memorial Day weekend, we are reminded of loss. We're reminded of that for those that we want to honor those that we want to even celebrate, Lord, for their defense of freedom and liberty, their defense of righteousness and of justice in our world. We never want to forget them. We always want to remember them. We want to remember their families, too. We want to remember their friends, too. Lord, would would they and their name continue to be honored in our time? We are also, Lord, reminded of these shootings that have been happening, this last one in Texas. It makes this morning, it makes this week a a week of, of tragedy and of difficulty. But it also reminds us of the only solution, the only answer, which is to come to our God and to cry out, mercy to cry out for salvation. That is what we come here to do today. We need you, Lord, and we pray you would hear our worship and our praises, and we would know that you are amongst us today. Bless us, Lord, uh, as we join in worship together this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and greet one another as the worship team prepares to lead us in song this morning.
standing for our scripture reading. Uh, we'll begin with a responsive reading this morning from verses 12 through 22 of Acts chapter 23. Uh, you'll find it on the screen as well as in your uh, bulletin. You'll read the highlighted text. The word of the Lord. When it was day, the Jews made a plot and bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. There was more than 40 who made this conspiracy. They went to the chief priests and elders and said, We have strictly bound ourselves to find oath and taste no food till we have killed Paul. 
Now therefore you, along with the council, give notice to the tribune to bring him down to you, as though you were going to determine his case more exactly. And we are ready to kill him before he comes here. Now the son of Paul's sister heard of their ambush, so he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. Paul called one of the centurions and said, Take this young man to the tribune, for he has something to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the tribune and said, Paul, the prisoner who called me, asked me to bring this young man to you, as he has something to say to you. The tribune took him by the hand and, going aside, asked him privately, What is it that you have to tell me? And he said, The Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down to the council tomorrow as though they were going to inquire somewhat more closely about him. So the tribune dismissed the young man, charging him, tell no one that you have informed me of these things. Jesus said that if I first I should come to him
please remain standing for our second scripture reading. And uh, this morning I have asked our uh, youth and children's pastor, Pastor Nick, if he would come and lead us in the reading of Acts chapter 23, verses 23 through 35. Pastor Nick. If you have the Bible right in front of you, it's in page 933. Then he called two of his centurions and said, Get ready 200 soldiers with 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen to go as far as Caesarea at the third hour of the night. Also provide mounts for Paul to ride and bring him safely to Felix the governor. And he wrote a letter to this effect. Claudius Lysias, to His Excellency the Governor Felix, greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them. When I came upon them with the soldiers and rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman citizen, and desiring to know the charge for which they were accusing him, I brought him down to their council. I found that he was being accused about questions of their law, but charged with nothing deserving death or imprisonment. And, it was, <clears throat> and when it was disclosed to me that there would be a plot against the man, I sent him to you at once, ordering his accusers also to state before you what they will what they have against him. So the soldiers, <clears throat> according to their instructions, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris, and on the next day they returned to the barracks, letting the horsemen go on with him. When they had come to Caesarea and delivered the letter to the governor, they presented Paul also before him. On reading the letter, he called, <clears throat> he asked what providence he was from, and when he learned that he was from Sicily, he said, I will give you a hearing when your accusers arrive. And he commanded him to be guarded in Herod's praetorium. Thank you, Thank you Pastor Nick. You may be seated. Would you continue worship together with me now in prayer this morning? Lord, as we sang a moment ago and as is so evident in your scriptures time and time again, uh, you are the God who is strong and kind. And Lord, we, we need you to be both. We recognize we live in a world of many dangers many enemies of much corruption and evil, and we need a strong God who can bear his arm and act. We are also beset with many weaknesses, many difficulties, many of our own failures and sins. And we know that we approach you, the Son of God, Lord Jesus, who came in the flesh to die for those sins shown us a love that we, can, we can't even imagine. Thank you, Lord, that you invite us to approach the throne of grace this morning, a throne that symbolizes power and rule and sovereignty, but a throne of grace where we are invited to come as lost sinners who have been found as rebels who have been made sons and daughters. Hear our prayers. Pray, Lord, for our own church and the ministry that you have given us to do, and we pray this morning uh, within our church for our single seniors ministry. We pray that they would continue to have fellowship and encouragement and growth together in the Lord. Uh, and, Lord, that they would continue to lead our church as they do in a multitude of ways. 
We pray, too, for missionaries that we support this week. We think in particular of Lars and Lisa Hornberg, who uh, serve primarily at an uh, orphanage or a collection of orphanages in Thailand, but have also worked in Romania. And we pray that you would bless that ministry and, and continue to save many, many children, Lord, that the world doesn't want, but we know, Lord Jesus, you can save. We pray in our own denomination, too, of uh, those churches that we stand shoulder to shoulder with in our proclamation of the gospel. Today we pray for uh, Pastor uh, Guerzo and for his wife Grace, who are part of a church plant in Stockton called Abide Church. Uh, Lord, may, may you give them fruitful evangelism and, Lord, continued new life uh, of people coming to Christ there in Stockton. We also pray, Lord, as um, I had mentioned last week, we want to be praying for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ. This morning we think of uh, one pastor in particular who's been imprisoned, serving a sentence of five and a half years in China. His name is Pastor Lee uh, Yunkai, and Lord, we, we pray that you would bless him. Bless him with your presence, Lord. Bless him with fruitful ministry, even in the prison. And Lord, would you release him from this unjust sentencing. We also want to pray this morning for those that uh, have served our country and are serving our country even today. Uh, this is a Memorial Day weekend. We do want to pray for our families. We want to pray for, uh, Lord, the, the remembrance, uh, a difficult one, of their loss. Lord, we pray for your comfort. We pray, Lord, that there would be even a sense of pride, a good pride that recognizes the willing and honorable sacrifice that they have made, uh, not only for this country, not only for citizenship in one country in the long history of the world, but in a fight for truth and justice and liberty, in a fight, Lord, for ideals that we believe are founded in your word. Lord, we pray that we as a church would remember them and we would see you act, Lord, to honor uh, men like this and women like this, sacrifice like this, and to lead, Lord, in the way we live in honor of their memory. Lord, we also want to thank you for the ways that you answer our prayer. We see you do it every week. We see you do it all the time. And often we don't see the many other ways you do answer prayer. But this morning, we, we thank you uh, for many of them. We thank you for uh, Mary, the sister of Patrick Moxley, who she had COVID and, and then got pneumonia and is getting much better. We, we thank you for that, Lord. Uh, we pray uh, for the Gertzen family. We've been praying a long time for... Um, uh, Walter and Carla's daughter, Elena, who delivered a healthy baby boy, uh, Sheridan Moss, on the 6th of this month. Lord, thank you for that answer to prayer. We also thank you that Carla, who's been having liver issues, are, they're just not as bad as were expected. Lord, thank you for that. We thank you in our own family of uh, my wife's cousin, Carrie, who uh, her test results after her uh, surgery showed that the cancer is all gone. And Lord, we are so grateful to hear that news. We do pray, in, more importantly, for Carrie and her husband, JT, for their salvation in Jesus Christ and that you would use myself and Laura to that end. We think, too, of uh, the mother of Ashley Roberts, Sharice, who they found stomach masses and then a recent PET scan showed that they're just all gone. They've just disappeared. And we count that a miracle from your answer to our prayers, Lord, and we thank you for your mercy. Finally, Lord, we, we thank you most of all for Nick, the son-in-law of Dan and Kathy Dollar uh, and husband to their daughter, Lisa, who just uh, maybe a week, two weeks ago, trusted in Jesus Christ for his salvation uh, after much prayer from this family. Lord, no, no greater news can we thank you for than this. And so, Lord, we thank you for uh, causing a, a celebration of angels in heaven over Nick. We also, Lord, want to give to you our, re our requests and our supplications. And chief among them, Lord, is certainly 
the shooting that has happened this past week in Texas. Uh, 19 children and two teachers who were murdered. Lord, we pray as we have been for their families. We pray for this community. We pray, Lord, for our country. We pray that this family would have a peace that can only come from the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that our country would be confronted with the reality that the answer to this shooting is not to scream into a camera. It's not a, a new legislation. It is for this country to fall to its knees before Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and to find forgiveness and peace and hope. Lord Jesus, would you empower us to be that kind of a witness in this society, a society that's trying desperately to control and answer things themselves. Lord, we fall to our knees. We know you alone are the answer. Lord, we also want to pray for those within our church and those that are very close to us, Lord, friends and family. Harold Stout was hospitalized this last week um, after just losing his wife, Patty, just a few weeks ago. Uh, we thank you that his levels kind of evened out and, and uh, he, he gained a little bit of strength, but he's in rehab now for at least a, a few weeks. And we pray that you would take him through that and, and Lord, heal him and bless him. We think of little uh, Elma Delgadillo, a four to five year old relative of Damaris Valdez, who uh, she was airlifted to a hospital with multiple viruses last week. Uh, Lord, we, we thank you that she has made some progress, um, but Lord is still there in the hospital. Lord, please give this little one your healing. We think too of uh, Emma Chavez, the mother of Karen Madrid, who uh, she, she had a hard time keeping any food down for six plus weeks and has had to move in with uh, Karen and, and Manuel and the family. Uh, this last week ha has taken a really dramatic and wonderful turn for the better, and we just pray that would continue for Emma. We also want to pray, Lord, uh, again for Tommy, the son of Gail Friesen, who's back in the hospital after alcohol abuse once again. And Lord, he needs to, to fight the bottle, but he needs more so to find uh, real hope in Jesus Christ, real significance, Lord, and real purpose in you. We also want to lift up Aurora Ramirez, who is the grandmother of Isaac Herrera, uh, who was also hospitalized this last week, and they then discovered several tumors. Laura, Lord, we just, we just pray that you would, give, you would give healing to her, that it would be a miracle just like Charissa's was and that the doctors right now would have uh, wisdom about what to do and what not to do for her. And Lord, that she and Isaac and the family would be trusting in Jesus Christ. Finally, Lord, we want to pray also for Kristen. She's only 31. She's the daughter of Stephen McCarty, who's a family friend of Susan Harms. And this last week, she also discovered that she has a brain tumor. They're waiting on test results. They're hoping and praying that these results will show that it is benign. And that's what we pray for, Lord. Uh, but we, we also, again, pray most of all that Kristen would, uh, would fling herself at your feet and know that she can find mercy and grace there and hope that lasts eternally. Lord, we have many requests this morning, but we give them to a God who uh, does not tire in hearing them, uh, it does not uh, need to be informed about them, and yet who condescends to answer these requests according to your good will and your good graces. We surrender them to you, Lord. We pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. At this time, uh, children may be dismissed to our children's classes. They're also welcome to stick around if they would like, but we'll have children's leaders that will be happy to receive them upstairs. Now, we're going to continue worshiping, and we're going to do so this morning in the giving of our tithes and offerings. Uh, to prepare us for that giving, I'd like to read uh, from Revelation and the scene around the throne of God, which says this in chapter 4, 
verses 9 through 11. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Let us now worship our Lord in the giving of our tithes and offerings this morning. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, John. Lord God, we ask that you would now speak to us. Uh, we have given you our praise, our prayers, uh, our fellowship. And now, Lord, we ask you to speak. We are ready to listen. Amen. Well, we are a people that are surprised by a great many things. Um, but often we don't like what we're surprised by. Every month, every week, it seems, we are surprised by things that we just never wanted to be surprised by. This week, in particular, of course, we're reminded of a, a Texas shooting, another shooting. But we're usually surprised by much smaller things a bill or an extra expense that we weren't planning on, uh, some car repair or a graduation expense or uh, maybe even uh, a broken appliance or a home repair. 
We're also surprised by accidents that, that may even take us to the hospital. Uh, may take a, a loved one there. It, it might be uh, a, a sickness or a medical condition that now is going to require surgery or, or advanced treatment for a long time. Uh, we're even surprised by things that are supposed to be good surprises, like a baby, as an example. I'm not saying anything about us, by the way. <laughs> Four surprises is enough. In short, we don't like surprises. And we serve a God who is never surprised. He's never surprised. In fact, he often likes to surprise us. And when we see the surprising hand of God at work, it leads us to worship. It it leads us to marvel at God and his care for us. It leads us to, to trust in his providence. That's the kind of surprising work of God that we see in our passage this morning in the book of Acts. It's a wonderful and a surprising work of God's providence for his people and against the evil surprises of our world. That is what we see in Acts chapter 23 this morning. Uh, We're going to begin with uh, one of those negative surprises, and that surprise is a plot. It's a plot that comes against the Apostle Paul's life, and it is a terrorist plot. And what our passage wants to teach us this morning is that God's providence is not surprised by terrorists. God's providence is not surprised by terrorists. Now, one little disclaimer before we get moving here. Uh, you're you're going to need probably one of these things this morning, a physical Bible. I don't have my usual uh, uh, quiver full of uh, sermon slides this morning, so we just get the main ones. You just get the uh, fill-in-the-blanks today. And, uh, you know, again, as I said before, um, I don't want you guys to get lazy. So, time to open up the Bible this morning. Uh, But turn with me to Acts chapter 23 as we look at uh, this terrorist plot. Now, I don't don't use this word terrorist lightly either. Uh, This describes them very accurately because they're committing an act of terrorism. Uh, It just so happens that this is happening also in the week that we saw an act like this uh, in our country. So let's examine the details. You look in chapter 23, verse 12. Uh, It says this, When it was day, the Jews made a plot and bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. Uh, This, first of all, and very simply, is is an assassination plot. Uh, This assassination plot, though, uh, secondly, is one that's cloaked in religious fervor. Uh, Verse 12, again, it says that they've bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink, and that could just be a personal oath, but most likely this is a religious oath. This is an act of devotion they are making to God to kill Paul. Uh, We get a little bit of a hint that that's probably what's going on in verse 14 when they go to the chief priests and elders and said, we have strictly bound ourselves by an oath to taste no food till we have killed Paul. They're going to these religious leaders to impress them. Look at the act of devotion that we are making to put this guy out, to silence him. Uh, They are committing terrorism. But third, we also see that this terrorist conspiracy, uh, it it goes to the highest level of the Jewish leadership. They go to the Jewish leadership here, and in verse 15, uh, they are accepting this advice. Uh, You, along with the council, give notice to the tribune to bring him down to you as though you were going to determine his case more exactly. Of course, that's not what was going to happen. That's not what they were going to do. They were going to use that as a ruse to kill him, and everyone's involved. Uh, This group of 40 men who are probably Jewish leadership themselves, but then the highest leadership of the elders and the high priest himself. This is a terrorist plot. Uh, The English Annotations, which is a collection of uh, commentary notes on different passages of the Bible, it says this about our passage. The most pernicious impiety loves the veil of public authority. 
Let me say that again. The most pernicious impiety loves the veil of public authority. Satan never does more wickedness than when he gains counsels to his side. Fourth and finally, we see about this terrorist plot that their commitment is one that would have likely ended in most of them dying. This was a a suicide mission. Verse 13 says there were more than 40 who made this conspiracy, and that that was out of necessity, most likely. Uh, F.F. Bruce makes this point, writing, Paul would be guarded by Roman soldiers. And an attempt to assassinate him, whether it succeeded or not, would inevitably involve the assassins in heavy loss of life. This was a life, a plot that would have ended in most of these 40 men dying. Now, though the enemy has and will use these kinds of tactics tactics of terrorism, God will be shown to be the victor. And he will do that by his providence. We see this also in the text. You look in verse 16, it says very simply that the son of Paul's sister heard of their ambush. So he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. This was no accidental overhearing. Uh, This is the providence of God. Now, this is the only mention of uh, a relative like this of Paul's, or at least a nephew of Paul's, And so we don't really know who he is, but F.F. Bruce makes a pretty interesting comment here when he says it's unlikely that he was present when it was hatched, that is the plot. Although it would be possible to construe the Greek text in this sense. When Paul says in Philippians 3.8 that for Christ's sake he has suffered the loss of all things, it's usually inferred and very reasonably so that he was disinherited for his acceptance and proclamation of Jesus as Messiah. His father, a citizen of Tarsus and a Roman citizen also, would certainly be a wealthy man, and it may be within that family who had disinherited him and and shunned him, maybe his mother, uh, the mother of Paul's nephew, that is, retained some sisterly affection for Paul, and something of that affection had passed on to her son. We do not know if she lived in Jerusalem, maybe she did, or perhaps she lived in Tarsus and her son, just like Paul, went to Jerusalem for education. And that's how he came to Paul. Thus, Paul's nephew may have been a part of this plot. He potentially could have been in the room when this plot was being hatched. If not, he at least has some kind of close association with those who did for him to get wind of this information. And this young man, we don't know how old, potentially a part of the plot himself, is then able to enter the barracks to tell Paul, to be escorted to the tribune to warn him, and to allow for the the necessary preparations to completely avoid this attack. One kid. The the more than 40 terrorists who are are fasting at this time, and, and perhaps... Uh, just praying even for God's success on this plot, are foiled by one youth. The religious leadership, who they successfully convinced the tribune to go along with their, their plot, to go along with their uh, idea. They, they had duped the Roman leadership, at least in their minds. They are upended. They are thwarted by one God is not surprised, in other words. As many have said, has it ever occurred to you that nothing ever occurs to God? In fact, it is his providential work that surprises his enemies time after time. And God is able to use whatever means, and often the humblest of means, to providentially surprise his enemies and to frustrate them and to embarrass them. And this likely would have been embarrassing to them. This is the way of Saul's conversion with Jesus. When he was on the road to Damascus himself, breathing murderous threats against the church, and he was made physically to be on his knees and blinded. Couldn't even see, and then ultimately led to his radical conversion. 
This is the way of the humble incarnation and crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the way of, of his birth in Bethlehem and his, his manger for a bed. His, his whole life in a backcountry town like Nazareth and even his entry into Jerusalem to fulfill his purpose on a little donkey. This is the way of, of the little boy with the five loaves and the two fishes. This is the way of this kid here in Acts 23. This is the way, in fact, of God's choosing you to be his witness. Amen? This reminds us, I think, of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, which says in verses 26 through 31, Consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, that are nothing, to bring to nothing the, the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Do not count your lowly position, church, as embarrassment, but as your boast, because your boast is in the Lord. It's in the right place. And part of that boast is, is being used, like any one of these people we've seen in the Bible, to thwart the plans of the wicked, to humbly shame the proud, and to declare to all the wonderful but humble message of a crucified Savior. We confront terrorism in our world today, and we trust God's surprising providence to work through it. Terrorism that we don't always have an answer for, like we do in Acts chapter 23, but terrorism which nonetheless we, we trust God is overcoming. In January of, of this year, out of Nigeria, I have this report from uh, Voice of the Martyrs. Uh, they say this, that uh, members of the Islamic State West Africa province, uh, a terrorist group, attacked a predominantly Christian village in Borno uh, last month, so this would have been in December of last year, killing 12 and wounding three others. The attack occurred on a Sunday afternoon shortly after village residents were leaving their church worship services. The attackers also burned down multiple homes and looted shops in the village. Quote, Christians who survived have been forced to flee the village, one survivor said. February 24th of 2022, same country, Nigeria, uh, says this, quote, members of the Islamic State West Africa province uh, attacked Pemi village on January 20th, killing one Christian and kidnapping 17 Christian teenage girls. The attackers also burned several homes and a local church building. Quote, more than two dozen houses were burned down, said an area resident. Quote, we need your prayers for God's deliverance from these forces of eagle, evil, unquote. The terrorist group had targeted another nearby village just days before the January 20th attack, killing three Christians and kidnapping five girls after burning down the village's church building. Quote, burning down our churches will not stop us from worshiping God, a survivor said. Pray for the Christians in these villages to remain firm in their faith amid this hostile opposition. Pray that their faithful witness can lead others in their communities to trust Christ, especially members of this terrorist group. Thank the Lord that we do not live in in a country where we have to worry about this kind of terrorist attack against the church. And then again, we do recognize, we see these kinds of things happening in different ways, uh, seemingly all the time in our country. But may we be humbled by the Lord to see what's going on in the larger church today and to pray for them. Would you pray for, for them right now along with me?
Father God, we pray this morning for our brothers and sisters who are standing strong in the faith, though they know they will face terrorist threats. We pray for our brothers and sisters that we just read about in Nigeria, different places there who are under constant threat of this terrorist group. Lord, thank you for the boldness of their witness, a boldness that teaches us, that encourages us to have grace and compassion and to extend salvation even to our greatest enemies. Lord Jesus, we know you are at work. We long to see uh, more of your obvious hand of providence overcome this kind of evil in our time. And we trust, Lord, that you are. We trust, Lord, that you will. In Jesus' name, amen. God's providence is, is not surprised by terrorists. The second, uh, God's providence is also the source of the world's governments. God's providence is the source of the world's governments. Now, this point is, is something of a, a side note in our text this morning. And rather than demonstrating the surprising work of God, it actually shows us the ordinary work of God, the ordinary order of God that should be in place and that he has ordained for us uh, to understand and live by. So it's, it's worth our consideration this morning. It's worth our understanding uh, as we, we look at this text. And where we see it is in this letter. When the tribune, Lysias, writes this letter to Governor Felix, he demonstrates biblical teaching regarding the ordained role of government that, that God has established. And he, he does this even though he is lying through his teeth, through his pen, about what really happened. Uh, he does recognize that he should have done the things he writes about that he did not do. And in that letter, we see very clearly uh, the proper role that government is supposed to uh, take. Now, before we look at that, that Tribune's letter, and so that you don't think I'm just making this up, let, let's look at one other passage that uh, helps us to substantiate this in the Bible, just a, uh, a book away here in, in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 13. I'll be reading verses 1 through 7, which gives us general guidelines for what uh, this looks like in uh, God's establishment of the government. Romans 13, 1 through 7 says this, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes." For the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Uh, let me break down this passage and look at a few different statements that uh, give us a, a clear explanation of what God intends government to do. First of all, in verse 1, it says that there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Uh, further, verse 2 says that these governing authorities are what God has appointed, which includes the specific people that are in those offices. Verse 4 describes uh, these governing authorities as God's servant, and it says that twice. Verse 6 says that the authorities are ministers of God. Now, what are they to do? What, that's their position, but what are they supposed to do? Well, first of all, uh, they are ordained by God to carry out God's judgment. Verse 2 says those who resist will incur judgment. Uh, they also, second, are here to uphold the good in society and punish the evil in society. Verse 3 says rulers are not a terror to good 
conduct, but to bad. Uh, Thirdly, they are here to serve for the good of all citizens. Verse 4 says, he is God's servant for your good. Uh, And then finally, it says that he's able and responsible to execute justice up to the the punishment of death. Verse 4 says, he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. In other words, God has ordained government to carry out his judgment to uphold good and punish evil, to serve and protect citizens, and to execute justice up to the punishment of death. These are the the general guidelines of God's uh, proper ordained government. And the laws of the Jewish scriptures spell out many of the practical case law examples of these principles in a little bit more detail, but they are principles that are present in Roman law. They're principles that are present in our American law today. So with this in mind, let's now examine the letter of Lysias and remember that he is trying to build a case before Felix uh, that he has Uh, fulfilled these kinds of guidelines properly, even though he he did not at all. So if you look back at uh, the book of Acts, and we look at 23, verse 27, this is what he writes. He writes in verse 27. This man, speaking of Paul, was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them when I came upon them with the soldiers and rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman citizen. Now, Lysias here is trying to demonstrate that he has protected the innocent and he's protected the rule of law. See, the Jews had unlawfully seized Paul and then they were unlawfully carrying out a procedure that would have executed him. Lysias is is also trying to communicate that there is a need to protect the right to a fair trial for Roman citizens, the same ones that that they are there to protect and to serve. Uh, We also see in, in verse 28 that it says, desiring to know the charge for which they were accusing him, I brought him down to their council. Uh, here, here we see a very clear need for formal charges and a, a actual uh, just fair trial uh, that is in line uh, for the protection of citizens. Uh, we, we see this not just in a general comment about protection in Romans 13, but we also see it in more specific examples in the Bible. Deuteronomy 19, 15 says, says this. It says, A single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that has been committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses shall a charge be established. It's Deuteronomy 19, 15. Uh, Roman law had a a similar kind of stipulation, and he is trying to demonstrate that in this letter. Verse 29, also, he says this. He says, I found that he was being accused about questions of their law, but charged with nothing deserving death or imprisonment. Uh, Here, he's showing a respect for the spheres of sovereignty and authority, that though, as in Romans 13, secular governments, or at least we should say non-Christian governments, they have been given authority to punish Uh, evil and to uphold the good, uh, they do not have authority to then enter into the religious sphere and tell religions how to worship God, tell religions how to operate, tell Christians how to do so. Uh, He's also establishing here the proper evaluation of of a punishment that must fit the crime. Uh, Another passage that helps us establish this is in Exodus 21, verses 23 to 25, one that uh, is often uh, shortened to eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Exodus twenty one twenty three to 25 says, If there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for bur- burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe, and so on. Uh, some think that this kind of a law is harsh. It, it's, it's a vindictive kind of law, but uh, in, in God's law, this is actually a a stipulation that the punishment must fit the crime, uh, that no one is allowed, no leader is allowed to go beyond the harm that was committed in leveling out punishment. No one is allowed to show favoritism and unjust measures. It must be equal. Punishment must fit the crime. 
Uh, Verse 30 uh, also says, he says in his letter, uh, when it was disclosed to me that there would be a plot against the man, I sent him to you at once, ordering his accusers also to state before you what they have against him. Again, you have protection of a citizen here. Again, you have the upholding of the rule of law and a fair trial of multiple witnesses. And you also have here a confrontation with Jewish leadership. Uh, He is confronting them and telling them that this is not going to continue until an actual real trial occurs. Now, all of this demonstrates that there is a proper standard for what the rule of law should be. And though this is not the main point of the text, and it's a little bit of of a a tough dig here, uh, it's very important for us and very useful for us to understand some of the biblical principles Uh, that God has ordained for our governments to operate under. Because we know we live in a world that even though they have these kinds of standards written in law, they will very regularly forget them or overlook them or twist them or use them for their own advantages. But God's law is very clear about what a government's uh, line is and what should order them. And we have a right as Christians, as those who uphold and are guardians of the truth of God, uh, that God has set the rules for you. God has set the rules for our governor, our state officials, for our president. And we have every right to remind them of these things uh, and to insist on them. To insist on them so that when we... uh, are interacting with the world around us, we, we can stand up for our freedom to be able to witness. We can stand up for our freedom to be able uh, to uh, raise our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Uh, to teach them uh, even something like the, the proper role of government. Uh, we are here to tell the world They do not have a right to twist their position. They don't have a right to cover over the truths of God that apply to it. This is why we take extra time to examine this side issue in the text, so that we could have a discerning witness in the world today, much like Paul did, because Paul did not receive fair treatment here. Uh, The tribune, if you remember in in the last chapter, He came to a crowd that was yelling at Paul. He immediately arrested him. Uh, He did not find out what the charges were. He didn't even know what the charges were, and he thought he might figure it out if he beat Paul up and flogged him by opening up his back. That's a good idea. He sided with the crowd against Paul without any formal charges, and then he proceeded to uh, go on a course that would basically get him executed. If he really flogged Paul, who was a Roman citizen, which he did not ask or investigate about, then uh, Lysias had every right to expect that he needs to flee the country. That's how serious of a charge this was. And Paul had a right to uh, expect that of him, and to do so not just for his own rights, but to, to uphold the truth of God and to witness for Jesus Christ. So God's providence is also, it's the source of the normal operation of the world's governments today. Finally, uh, we'll look at this point, that God's providence is sovereign over all powers. God's providence is sovereign over all powers. Now, this gets us back to the main point of our passage, and and really to the entire book of Acts. What we're reading here in Acts chapter 23, it's just a a sub-story. It's a sub-story of a longer story that really starts in Acts chapter 20 and goes all the way to the end of Acts, Acts chapter 28. And that story is a fulfillment, it's a completion of the entire book of Acts, a a book that started with with one charge from Jesus Christ that will be fulfilled by the time Acts is completed, when Jesus says in Acts 1-8 to his apostles, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. By the time we get to Acts 28, Paul will have been escorted speedily to Rome, the center of the then-known world, the capital of the Roman Empire, the end of the earth. God will show 
that his providence has succeeded. He has fulfilled his promise. And if you look back at just a few verses in Acts chapter 23, verse 11, right before our passage, God told Paul, take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. We see this providence of God unfolding, uh, not just in these general comments that we see, but we also then see it in in the specific details of how uh, this unfolded uh, through the, the book of Acts chapter 23, the chapter Acts 23. Uh, We see it, first of all, from the very beginning. When this terrorist plot plot, uh, came along, this this only served to speed along Paul's journey. The plot of the Jews created a situation where it became necessary for the tribune to rush Paul ahead. Paul may, may have stayed for several days, several weeks, several months there in Jerusalem, awaiting trial, awaiting investigation. He may have succumbed to some plot along that time, but but no. The, the plotting of, of these terrorists, uh, which they thought were, were so clever, which they, we, they thought were, were, was so devote to God, uh, it, it, was, it was overcome. It was used by God and thwarted. Second, we see the tribune, when he writes this letter, he testifies to in the innocence of Paul by accident, completely by accident. He's, he's writing a letter, a letter in the most favorable way for himself, but as he does that, he has to, uh, he has to show the innocence of Paul. He, he has to uh, give Paul a, a good reputation before Felix, the governor, and, and, and it, by necessity, uh, allows him to continue uh, along God's providential will. Third, when, when Lysias uh, then sends Paul, he goes to great lengths for Paul's sake, something that is completely the opposite of just a few moments ago when he was ready to flog Paul and and rip open his back with the lashes. Uh, Here's what he did, verse 23, it says this, he called two of the centurions and said, get ready 200 soldiers with 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen to go as far as Caesarea at the third hour of the night. Now, you know, I went to Bible school, so I'm not great at math, but uh, if you add these up, he is assembling 470 soldiers to accompany Paul to Caesarea. And these 470 soldiers were also to travel at the third hour of the night, which is the three hours from nightfall, which would have been around 9 p.m. at their time, so that they are going to march all the way through the night basically without stopping until they get to Caesarea. Uh, Caesarea is about 35 miles away. If you do the math, again, you know, Bible school here, but if you do the math, if they traveled about four miles per hour, it would take them nine hours to go 35 miles. If they went uh, like an average of three miles per hour, it would take them about 12 hours to get to Caesarea. That is dedication. That is an incredibly special envoy for Paul. And then the next day, uh, a smaller group takes Paul the rest of the way, but they still have 27 miles to go uh, to get uh, to Caesarea, or to, or to get on to the, the next place after that. They stopped at Antipatris, and then they went to Caesarea. Uh, furthermore, though most of the soldiers would have been marching on foot, Paul, Paul does not. You know, we often watch movies where prisoners are taken along, and they're all bound up in chains and dragged by a horse, and eventually they end up laying down and, you know, get all nasty. But uh, here, Paul Paul had special treatment as well. Here in verse uh, 35, uh, it says this for Paul, uh, or not in verse 35, but verse uh, 24. It says, also provide mounts for Paul to ride and bring him safely to Felix. So mounts meaning a horse. Get him a horse ready. While the majority of these soldiers, about 400 of them, are marching on foot, basically without stop, Paul is sitting comfortable and pretty up on a horse. And you can imagine that uh, these men, who again, they're doing this through the night, nonstop, they're probably looking at Paul and, and very upset, to put it mildly. 
and yet Paul gets special treatment. This tribune, you can see here how serious his situation was, how much trouble he got in to allow all these things to happen. And God uses this by his providential care. You could also see even Paul's shrewdness. We talked about this last week. If Paul didn't wait until he was being stretched out to be whipped to then tell them he was a Roman citizen, he may not have gotten this kind of special treatment. He waited till an, an opportune time when many levels of government would have been liable for him, and that now led to this incredible uh, posh treatment that he's getting as a prisoner. But one more detail should be pointed out, and this is done by Felix once he gets there, uh, all the way to Caesarea. Verse 35 uh, says this. He said, Felix says, uh, I will give you a hearing when your accusers arrive. And he commanded him to be guarded in Herod's praetorium. Now, praetorium is a big word and it's kind of a weird one, but this is Herod's palace. This is Herod the Great's palace. Herod the Great, who spared no expense when he built things during his time. This is the same palace where the governor would be living. So Paul, he's not in some prisoner's cell with other prisoners. He's not even in a, in a private cell by himself, which would have been nice enough. No, he, he's in the palace of the governor. Or may, maybe he's munching on grapes, I don't know. Can anything more clearly be demonstrated in this passage, then the providence of God and the undeniable fulfillment of his plan. John Calvin writes of this passage that we ought to ascribe it to the grace of God that the tribune showed, showed such courtesy and kindness. For God promised that he would give favor to his people in the eyes of the Egyptians. He is accustomed to softening hearts of iron, taming fierce spirits, and making those whom he has decided to use to help his own people consider it in every way. Rudolf Gualther writes it this way. He says, These things are intended to teach us that we should not concern ourselves too much with human enterprises. Instead, we should strive to please the one God who is able to bring peace to barbaric minds, tame savage behavior, and even to transform our enemies so that they love us. Let these things refresh us so that with invincible perseverance of faith, we overcome the tyranny of the world living eternally in heaven with Jesus Christ, our Savior, to whom be praise, honor, glory, and power forever. Amen. Well, more simply written is a, a quote I also came across on Twitter by a James Anderson, which says this. Does God intervene in history? No. God no more intervenes in history than an author intervenes in his own novel. So church, what, what powers in this world are going to stop the providence of God? What authorities in our country cannot be instantly humbled, instantly turned on their heads, instantly embarrassed for the speedy fulfillment of God's will? What evil actors, even terrorists, are outside the hand of a sovereign God? Do we believe that God is fulfilling his plan and he always will? Do we believe in the face of the tribunes and terrorists of our world? Do we believe in the face of, of all the thousands of things that surprise us every week from the, the frustrating surprises around our homes uh, or, or those in our communities or those in our own bodies or even those crazy things that are going on in our, our child's nefarious little minds? God is reminding us today God is reminding us of his remarkable, his surprising, and his unstoppable providence that will accomplish all of his will in his time so that you might marvel at your God, so that you might trust his hand at work even when you don't see it the way we do in Acts 23, and so that you can have confidence and hope and every expectation of the glory of God. We read some terrorist 
activity going on in different countries, but we also see just the opposite. We do see in our world today God working in surprising ways that uh, cannot be explained in any other way than his providence. Another country where we see the same kinds of terrorist activity that we read about a minute ago is Iran. And here's an article uh, from the end of 2020 by Joel Abbott, which says this, quote, third party survey shows explosive church growth in Iran, confirming at least one million Christians. A new survey by a, a, a Netherlands based research group has supported the claims of rapid church growth inside Iran in recent years. There are approximately 300,000 known Christians who have lived in Iran for centuries, but the new survey uh, found that 1.5% now of all respondents identified as Christian, a number that surpasses 1 million uh, out of the 80 million Iranian citizens. The findings confirm that many mission agencies and ministries have reported uh, this over the past decade. The Joshua Project, uh, which is a research project highlighting unreached people groups worldwide, has claimed that 1.6% of Iranian citizens are Christian, with a 19.6% annual growth rate among evangelical churches. Uh, Afshin uh, Shahi, a UK-based lecturer, uh, he had said this about the results. Over the last 40 years, the country has gone through a gigantic socio-cultural transition, he said. The survey here highlights the fact that a very large segment of the population no longer identifies with Shia Islam, which is used as the ideology of domination by the state. Given these contradictions between the Islamic Republic and the wider Iranian society, it is not surprising that the supreme leader regards cultural invasion as more dangerous than a military invasion, end quote. Converting to Christianity is still punishable by imprisonment or death in Iran. God's providence is always at work. If we have eyes to see it, we will find it. And it will always surprise us. It's not surprised by the work of terrorists. It has ordained a system of government that should operate the way God has given and that he often uses to protect his church. And it's a providence that is sovereign over every power that we face. Would you pray with me? Father God, we, we need to hear of your providence, especially in a week like this, and it just so happens that you have given us this text to study this morning. Lord, we confess we are more easily overcome by the surprises we see in our world today rather than uh, the surprising activity of our God. Help us to have eyes to see, biblical eyes to see, the wonderful providence of our God. Providence that have brought us to faith in Jesus Christ, that has brought us to this moment, this Sunday, to worship you. Brought us, Lord, perhaps brought someone this morning to say for the first time to the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus, forgive me. I repent of my sins. I repent of my rebellion. And, and I call out to you for salvation and forgiveness of my sins and eternal life. Lord, would you help us to believe that nothing that happens today or tomorrow is by accident and nothing will ever catch you by surprise. You are so good to us, Lord. And we trust ourselves into the care of a gracious, a providential, a wonderfully merciful Heavenly Father. Amen. Please stand as the worship team prepares to lead us in one final song this morning. Our 
God, new help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Our shelter from the stormy past and our eternal home. Under the shadow of thy throne, thy saints have dwelt secure. this morning I'd like to read from Hebrews chapter 13 verses 20 to 21. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant equip you with everything good that you may do his will working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Shout to the Lord all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I seek for joy 